for the artists, for the passionate. Welcome to the Adventures Elsewhere podcast. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Adventures Elsewhere podcast. I am your host Jay Black and today I'm reviving an old project in a sense. You might remember if you've been around for a while now at this point. Early on I did an episode that was I believe entitled Rip Up the Craft Books. And I intended to make that into a series at that point, but I didn't really like the way it was turning out. It felt too visceral and sort of too negative. So I ended up shelving it. But I still think it's a conversation that it needs to be had that actually craft books generally make your writing worse. And it's sort of been reborn in this episode as craft books are the antithesis of quality writing because they kind of are. So um, if you're a craft bookaholic, <laughs> strap in. I mean, I'm not really sure what you're doing here in the first place. Are you lost? <laughs> okay, well, stone spicy today. I guess that's my mood. So the whole place this comes from for me is... I mean, there'll be more about this in time. The full story will come out in time. But there was a point at which I was told by some a very questionable part of the writing community for so many reasons at this point that basically you have to follow craft books or you're not a good writer and if you don't, you're immature, you don't really get it and all of these things, and actually if you have proper passion for your work, that's somehow childish or whatever. And if you think proper creativity is bad, like, uh, have you ever listened to jazz? For starters. But also, passion and entrepreneurialism are not mutually exclusive. Have you ever seen a really successful entrepreneur talk about their brand, their business, whatever, without passion. Musicians, artists, all of those people within the arts, have you ever heard them talk about their art without passion? Loving your work is not wrong. Enjoying your craft is not wrong. Being creative and letting things happen, that's jazz. And jazz is awesome. Jazz is the shit. So, I don't want to go straight on to the specifics of craft books so much as think about exactly what they're trying to be as a starting point. Because writing Craft books are effectively trying to be writing theory. And the theory of writing and how to write a bestseller every time. And being in different art sectors, I've come across theory of a lot of different arts in my time. I'm going to take two as the main points in terms of music theory and art theory. And the reason I'm doing this is because all of it is bullshit. All of it. Let's talk about music theory first. And the first thing I want to bring up when it comes to music theory is the origin of music theory, because not a lot of people are aware, because why would they be, that music theory was not written by composers. No. Music theory was written by analysts trying to 
science music. As if music is not one of the single most passionate art forms that comes straight from the soul. They wanted to try and science that shit. And what's even worse on top of that is they were analysing, you know, classical music, but from a very select set of composers. So if you ever actually do a critical listen to classical music or an analysis of score, it immediately falls down. I mean, as good an example as any is fucking Beethoven. Right there. If you've ever listened to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, arguably the single most famous piece of classical music of all time by probably the single most famous classical composer, Rhythm Rules? Nah. Fuck that. And this is true for Holst and Liszt too. I mean, Holst's Planets is another thing that, you know, I would say a lot of people, maybe not most people, but a lot of people have heard of. And it just doesn't follow music theory rules in terms of harmony or rhythm. Does that mean it's not an absolutely beloved piece of music across everyone, pretty much? And a lot of, you know, professional practitioners in music, and no, no it doesn't. People regard Beethoven as, I mean, it's not uncommon to see Beethoven as the greatest composer of all time. Did he follow music theory? No, he fucking didn't. He was very famous for not following music theory, even at the time. And if you're struggling to get your head around this in terms of classical music, or if you just straight up don't believe me, here's a sample of Holster's Neptune as arranged on organ. Now, if you know anything about music theory, you can't hear this piece of music arranged like that without hearing how far off from all the theory rules it is. You cannot do it. And this still applies in modern music today, so I mean, another amazing artist who has been hailed for generations and still is, who did not give a fuck about music theory and all those rules, David Bowie! Do you think Aladdin Insane follows any rules? And even beyond that, ev- just about everything in metal, certainly everything in punk, and just about everything in pop music doesn't follow rhythm rules, that's for damn sure. I mean, pop music is just four on the floor the whole time, and that is absolutely against just about all of the rhythm rules. So yeah, music theory is bullshit. Now let's talk a little bit about art theory, and we're going to go on to proportion charts first, because proportion charts annoy the fuck out of me. Because the classic one you always see is a woman's shoulder width is one to one and a half heads. That's how, you know, sort of maximum boundary of a woman's shoulders, maybe, maybe, maybe two, depending on if you have someone who's a little bit more open-minded or not, basically, but... One and a half, one point seven five is generally considered maximum. And um, have you ever looked at what people actually look like? Because that ain't it. I mean, it's just not. People do have more bone structure than that, and a lot of this comes from Disney and the sort of classic, sort of in air quotes, golden age Disney. And for whatever reason, people still hold that art style as kind of the holy grail of cartoons, and it's fed into more realism circles as well, and it's just bizarre to me because it is not what people look like. Not even close. 
And if you just do a very basic anatomy study, you'll realise how quickly all of that falls down immediately. And that's just in the sense of wanting to go for something a little bit more realistic, not even full-on realism or hyper-realism or photorealism or any of that, just trying to get actual more real-world proportions. And when it comes to cartoons, everyone says, no, no, you have to follow this for cartoons. And Fucking with proportions is like the number one thing you do with cartoons. That's like the signature thing. The signature thing with cartoons, surely, is not is to make your own wacky proportion set or just throw caution to the wind and think, okay, let's just do whatever the fuck we want. It's not about any of this. And so, sort of regardless of what you're trying to do, unless you're trying to draw in the Golden Age Disney style, Mainstream proportion charts just do not work. Like, they actively look wrong. And I also want to talk about colour theory a bit here as well. So aspects of colour theory, this is... I'm talking about this maybe more in a bit of a game sense, although classic colour theory of, you know, these two colours work together and these three work together is still a thing I think is very much up for debate. So, I mean, the classic one is blue and orange as a complementary colour palette. It's fucking ugly. It is. And it shouldn't be hailed as no, because they're opposite on the colour wheel. It's right. No, it's ugly, mate. Cut it out. It's gross. And, you know, that is a valid opinion to have. And when it comes to, you know, the three-pronged tricolour palettes, and oh no, you can't use these three colour sets together. Well, I've seen them together, they look nice. Fuck you. <laughs> it's not about whether it looks right on the textbook, it's about whether it is actually nice to look at. The only one hard and fast colour theory rule I agree with is don't use blue and yellow together, because that is genuinely fucking disgusting. That is horrible. But, you know, the complimentary one, purple and yellow is supposed to look good? No, it fucking doesn't. It doesn't. It's horrible. Don't... Ugh. But with colour theory as well, there's colour association about how red... I mean, I'm talking about this definitely more in a game design sense. Red is health, blue is mana, but, you know, purple, black is evil, and white is good, and yellow is happy, and all those things, and... I mean, that's good if you want to throw together a quick, dirty prototype. But honestly, it's pretty boring as a gamer, and particularly as a dev and an artist, to think, oh no, this colour can only mean this thing. And it's a lot more interesting, even as just a casual player, let alone a dev or an analyst, to play a game where actually purple is good and green is bad. It's... It's really quite interesting when people play with that and how it breaks down those associations. That's a really fun, interesting thing with art. And writing is also art. And all of these rules, it's just like, well, it's art. The point of art is not to have rules. The point of art is to be creative and to make something that means something and has passion behind it. And particularly when it comes to colour associations, it's very generic. And colour association is also breaks down as soon as you start to talk about colour blindness and accessibility. Because, for example, if you've got red-green colour blindness and you have never seen red in your life, but all of those emotions that are associated with red are going to be pushed elsewhere, and red is effectively going to be blank. So, it falls down really, really quickly. And there's sort of a couple of general rules you see with writing. I mean, the idea of rules in art is just bullshit, unless they're of your own creation, by the way. But the idea... I've seen a lot of the time in sort of just general writing theory that doesn't necessarily tie to a specific craft book, but I'm sure it does at this point, is that your story has to be relatable. And this is one of the biggest loads of bullshit ever, because all it really 
feeds into is elitism and discrimination, because it very quickly becomes well, anything in a fantasy setting is just not relatable because we don't live in a fantasy world, or something with horror and lots of creatures. Well, we don't live in that sort of world, so that's automatically not relatable. Historical settings, well, we don't live in the 1600s, and it very quickly descends into something a lot more problematic where you get into psychological horror because it's like, well, only, you know, this tiny percentage of people have schizophrenia, so this isn't relatable, this isn't worth publishing. And it's like, okay, but uh, did you hear what you just said there? Do you not, are you not hearing this? And then you get into, okay, but I can't relate to a black character, I can't relate to a woman, I can't relate to a gay character, and it's like, my dude... <laughs> That's a bullshit argument. You absolutely can, because it's not about that. And granted, big stories about racism for people who haven't, if that's the main theme and people haven't experienced that, yes, it can be harder, but that doesn't mean the whole thing isn't relatable because you can still connect to someone's inner personality and think, okay, they're just being treated horribly. And I understand the feeling of being treated horribly, not in this particular context, but... And the whole idea that it has to be relatable in the first place is bullshit. It, it, particularly in a... Coming from game design, the purpose of stories in games is to entertain. And this is true in the vast majority of literature too, the purpose is to entertain. And it can have deeper meanings, deeper connotations, and all that as well. And it's not going to detract from the entertainment factor, and really, it's only going to add to it. But entertainment is the main purpose in fiction. So, and it doesn't have to be relatable to be entertaining. And then you get into, again with this, foreign names are apparently hard to understand. I'm sorry, mate, that's just racist. Just, it's just an excuse to try and push marginalised stories and cultures out of publishing, and it's just really patronising as well. And this is the whole thing with craft books for me, is it's not just patronising to readers to assume that they can't possibly understand anything that's not their exact lived experience, and in a names they haven't ever seen before and they just can't possibly understand it. And like, yeah, they might miss like a meaning somewhere or might pronounce it a little bit wrong, but it's not like people don't do that with Western names anyway. It it happens a lot. You spell McIntyre slightly differently, nobody knows how to fucking say it. But it also patronizes writers really, really badly as well. Because the overall thing with craft books is essentially what it boils down to is them saying to you, if you follow these templates that I've made, because I'm brilliant for whatever reason, by the way, I'm some arrogant fucker who thinks I, the sun shines out of my ass, so I can make a template and that's going to be the best thing since sliced bread. And if you follow that, you, your little underling down there, then you can be a great writer. Firstly, that's all bullshit, and it's not creative. And second, you know who the first person who said that to you was? That high school English teacher you fucking hated. So if you're going for all these craft book templates and beat sheets and all like, I couldn't possibly deviate from the Save the Cat beat sheet, all you're doing is limiting yourself to really no better than GCSE anything. Okay, how does that make you feel, that you're writing GCSE level work just longer? And when it comes to beat sheets and things like that, I said this in the first episode, but that was so long ago, it's worth repeating. If you make your own beat sheet, this is the key, your own beat sheet, and that's something you want to do, hey, go for it, whatever, if that works for you, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. Whatever. That's up to you. 
If you're a plotter, I can see how that can be really helpful. But if it's somebody else's beat sheet, like the Save the Cat beat sheet that fuck knows how many thousands, if not millions of people have used for millions of stories, all you're going to do is bore people with that. Like genuinely, where's the creativity? Where's the passion? Where's your own creative input in that? I don't see the point in that. Why why wouldn't you want to bring your passion, your own unique taste to that? And when it comes to another thing that is just outright patronising and stupid, is I can't remember which craft book this is from. I'm not convinced it was credited in the original tweet, and I really wish it had been so that I could include it here, is someone had taken a picture of a page from a craft book and it boiled down to, don't use words that are more than five letters long. Ever. You can't be fucking serious with that. And the reason given for this is because it's too hard to understand. I mean, if you're talking about writing picture books for toddlers, maybe. But, um, are you going to try and tell me that a mountain and a big hill are the same thing? Because they ain't. <laughs> and, I mean, especially if you're talking about adult literature... I mean, I'm just not really sure where to begin with how patronising that is. And it's also, as well, it's just... You can't have an order of magnitude near the level of nuance you need to have in adult literature with words that short. If you can't say mountain, even, I mean, that's eight letters. I mean, I don't... I. If this doesn't make you lose all faith in that craft book immediately, if you see shit on this level, I just don't know what's wrong with you. If you're really going to take something like that as gospel, you... I mean, you're going to realise very quickly if you actually try and do that outside of, you know, picture books for kids, and I would argue, honestly, I'm still patronising for the kids. You realise it's impossible to write anything of any actual quality very quickly. Even just as a writing exercise to prove a point, you know? And then you get on to more specific rules that are genuinely just about stifling creativity at the expense of quality. And I've picked out three that you see banded around all the time, but there have been so many more on previous boards, I just don't want this to be like two hours long. Number one for me on this is all this shit around dialogue tags, because you get an equal number of people saying, only ever use said, repetition, boring, or never use said, uh, well, there's a time and a place for it, honestly. Or only ever use dialogue tags. You have to use a dialogue tag as soon as there's any dialogue. Which, repetition, boring, bad flow, a lot of the time. And, guys, just use your brain. I mean, if you actually... If you think that writing a novel is something you can do, you should be able to have a basic level of judgement to know when to do this and when not to, and what words to use, and you're like, yeah, it might be a placeholder word that you change later in, you know, <laughs> push that problem onto Editor Jade, but you at least know when you should and shouldn't use a dialogue tag intrinsically to some kind of extent. You're not going to use one on every single piece of dialogue, because that's just crap. And it's, again, you border into patronising. People know what speech marks mean. You don't need to, hey, have an extra clarifier beyond, you know, the punctuation that's only used for the one fucking thing. You don't need that. And a lot of the time it really does kill flow. It really kills pacing. It kills a lot of nuance as well. 
about and freedom of thought in terms of, well, did they say it like this or did they say it like that? And either works and leave it up to the reader and all of that stuff. And talking about flow and clumsiness of language because it does read very clumsy very quickly. Adverbs. Now this is probably the hottest of the hottest button topics in the writing community is not using adverbs and it comes from <laughs> that really stupid quote from Stephen King there, I fucking said it. Yes, that man probably does have some really good advice, but that one is fucking stupid. Because adverbs, and this is the thing people don't realise and just don't really seem to think about, like genuinely, is the flow of your prose. And how the prose sort of feels to say and how naturalistic it is. Adverbs really just help move things along a lot of the time and can avoid some just like really clumsy phrasing. If you want to say someone frowned worriedly, for example. If you want to get rid of worriedly, it's like in a worried fashion or it ends up you end up using an extra 10, 15 words and it's just clumsy and clunky and it's not good. Granted, there's a time and a place where an adverb isn't the right language and actually you want to use other terms, maybe you want to be a bit more vague, but saying never use adverbs is just, okay, we'll never have flow then. And have all your posts be really clumsy. Okay, great. That's, that's going to make me a bestseller, isn't it? Fuck you. And the other one, and this is one that genuinely boggles my mind. Words ending in ing are apparently a no-go. And I've never seen an actual reason for this. Like, genuinely, I've never seen a reason for this. And, um, let's scare the craft bookers here and remind them, <laughs> present tense exists. It does. And things do happen in real time. Someone can be going and doing something at the same time. That is called real life, real world naturalism. Things happening at the same time that... And flow as well, again. And clunky phrasing and all of these things. But the one that people seem to forget as well, in particular, it's action scenes. I don't see how you're supposed to write action scenes without using ing words, especially in present tense, without the whole thing just feeling weirdly stilted and having no stakes in it. Because if things are happening in real time, then there's stakes, and if you're going to try and follow all of these things, all of these templates that are made by someone who's probably just really fucking arrogant, Genuinely, probably, just really arrogant. Trying to science the shit out of an art. Potentially someone who's not even a writer who is trying to science this shit. And it assumes everybody has the same associations with particular words. And thinks only certain things are relatable that feeds into, you know, just discrimination of all kinds. Thinks that no one can understand anything with any nuance in an adult literature space, words that are more than five letters long. If you think any of that, if you're following all of that together, all that's going to do is give, a, give you a headache and decision paralysis, and it's not going to result in quality literature. It's going to result in something that's bland, very, very bland, that follows a very predictable plot structure and not in a good way, with characters that are probably paper cutouts because the entire thing is so insanely plot driven that all the decisions that the characters might make are just unrealistic unless they're just bad stereotypes. And then what does that say about, you know, discrimination and <laughs> all of those things and the overarching point is craft books do not make you better. Practice makes you better. Finding your own voice and your own creativity, putting your own input 
into things, making things actually naturalistic with some flow, with some character, with some, <laughs> here's a word that will scare the shit out of all the craft bookers, stylization and creativity and nuance. That's the shit. I think that's the main point dealt with. So, if you are a fellow writer, as opposed to an... I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I'm not. If you are a fellow writer, and you are published, or well on the way, please do get in touch. I would love to be a part of your journey. The way to do that is via email at jade42black at gmail.com. There is a list of things I want to know in the description first. Please read that. It's just easier and better for everybody if no automatic no's are given and all of those sorts of things. If you are indie or self-pub, you are the people I want to hear from the most. Now, I know this is where most of the quality literature is, but I know there is still a fair amount of quality literature in trad pub as well, and if you're one of those people, I'm still open to talking to you. It doesn't have to be adult literature, it doesn't have to be new either, it also doesn't have to be out yet, it doesn't have to be a particular genre or anything like that, it doesn't have to be a novel either. I'm happy to talk about novellas or anthology, do an overview of a trilogy, whatever you got, bring it in and let's see what we can do. And if you're looking to find me elsewhere, if you're here, you're probably looking for the home of the podcast, where you'll get advance notice of what the episode is for the week. So if you've been enjoying my writing in different genres and format series, you'll get advance notice of when that's around, and soundbite teaser reels for episodes like this, or any episode, and you can try and think, ooh, what's this one today? Hit up Instagram, I'm jade underscore black 21 on there. And if you're looking for more sort of live updates about my writing and about proper, true, character-driven stories that are just full of passion and soul and all of those beautiful things and adverbs, <laughs> I'm getting way too much fun out of this, that is Twitter. I am jadeblack21 on there. So that is all I have for today. So until next time, you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a like. It helps the channel a lot. Intro and outro music by me, copyright JPLAC 2024.